harbor. It was a time of national strife. The enemy seemed to be at our back door, ready to burst in. The next day, President Franklin D. Roosevelt addressed the Congress of the United States. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy with confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. How did this provocative threat by the Japanese Empire affect Americans, especially those who were of Japanese heritage and living on the West Coast, closest to the enemy's guns? Milton S. Eisenhower, the director of the War Relocation Authority, explained what happened in the following months. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, our West Coast became a potential combat zone. Living in that zone were more than 100,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds of them American citizens, one-third aliens. We knew that some among them were potentially dangerous. But no one knew what would happen among this concentrated population if Japanese forces should try to invade our shores. Military authorities therefore determined that all of them, citizens and aliens alike, would have to move. In early 1942, just two months after Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt signed an executive order, number 9066, requiring all persons of Japanese ancestry living on the West Coast to be transferred by the United States Army to areas deep in the American interior, away from the possible war zone, away from their friends, away from their farms and jobs, away from their religious temples and churches, away from their schools, away from their homes. Over 100,000 Japanese American citizens and aliens were bused to what were called internment camps, located in isolated areas of Idaho, Wyoming, California, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and Arkansas. Although the government tried to make this mass migration as easy and as painless as possible, for most of these people were United States citizens and had broken no laws, Still, this uprooting had a profound effect on those who were forced to give up their basic freedoms by force of law. Hello, I'm Joanne McKay, an instructor in secondary education at Iowa State University. I'm one of the instructors who works in multicultural, non-sexist education. And this afternoon, we are fortunate to have gathered here Grace and Min Amamiya, Servinder Ball, and Diana Jackson to discuss with the Amamiyas their memories of the internment of persons of Japanese ancestry in the United States in 1942. Servinder, I think you had a question to start us out today. I do. I was wondering um, what it was like um, after, right after Pearl Harbor. There was a lot of war hysteria, I believe, because it was such a shocking thing to happen. And uh, people like Westbrook Pegler and Walter Winchell and uh, the Hearst newspaper kept saying, well, nothing has happened, therefore it's going to happen. And so we were under suspect, I think, at all times. So they were expecting you to fight back or something or well, get organized or they thought well, something like that would happen? Expected, but there was a lot no, of I think that they had expected us to be organized already, too perform some espionage for the Japanese forces, uh, which was not true. Mm -hmm. And because nothing happened, the feeling was they're getting, just getting ready to, for it to occur. And uh, it was one of the, the fears of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was just strictly racial discrimination, don't you think? Yes. Yeah. And uh, there's many of the organizations came outright and showed their discrimination. and. Um, uh, it was beyond their comprehension that um, non-Caucasians who spoke a foreign tongue could be good Americans. And they stressed that a lot, and so we were viewed with fear, and they kept saying, 
Well, yellow skin was not fit for the white supremacy picture. And the president issued the executive order 9066 that authorized the military to detain all undesirable persons. It didn't specify the Japanese as a race. It included the, those of Italian and German descent. But certainly, uh, as history will show, the Germans and the Italian descendants were not affected by this executive order. Just those of Japanese descent were affected. Well then, did you have any idea what to take or where you were going or anything once you heard about this order? Or? No, they, they, the order was that we had to dispose of our homes, our property, and other things that we owned. Or if you were in business, you had to sell your business. And uh, the banks uh, froze a lot of the assets of people who did have money, so they were uh, having difficulty with their financial you know, aspects of this. At the time, as soon as you were told to dispose of things, you put some things in storage? Well, we did, and our church was nice enough to say that we could store some of our things in the second story of the church. But while we were gone, uh, our things were vandalized, as were all the people who had set, taken their things there. And um, they weren't of monetary value, but they were memorabilias and like Mother's Kimono and things that we had, high school awards and pictures and of our relatives and things that, as I said, was of no monetary value to anyone else. But it was a big loss for us. And then we had to turn in our cameras and radios and, and um, guns and knives and ceremonial swords that some of the families had. Did you know that the military was going to come and get you? Or how, how soon before they came did you know? Well, about five or seven days before, they would let us know, they said. And so pack up your house? And that's that's right. Uh -huh. And uh, well, we were told to pack up, but they said that they would, within five days to a week, they would let us know when the specific date would be. And so then we were told to get ready and uh, we could have one sea bag of beddings and then two suitcases full of things, uh, which included everything. You know, and uh, it was just what you could carry with you. Well, I think it's, you can imagine being asked to, to leave your hometown with that which you can carry with you yeah. and not knowing where we were going or for how long. And I think one of the questions that uh, students often ask is, you know, why, why didn't you resist? Uh, you know, we're in the 80s, we think, boy, it was strange that the, the people didn't resist. So, yeah. well, we were told that this was our way to prove our loyalty to the United States. And as a group, we were just too young to, to um, have any stronger feelings, I guess, about it. We were told to obey, therefore we obeyed. And we didn't have any civil rights groups to fight our cause. And we didn't have strong leaders that felt that we should do anything differently. It's not that there weren't any civil rights groups at that time. It, it was just that they weren't vociferous enough. They weren't vocal enough, nor were, there, were they great in numbers. I know the Quakers and the church groups were all for us, but for some reason or other, their voices were not heard. The American Civil Liberties Union were very active, but they too were, were kind of a minor voice in the wilderness. Now, did everybody go that was uh, supposed to? Well, uh, we were told everyone of Japanese ancestry and uh, were picked uh, up. That's right, huh? And the 1940 census uh, showed that there were about 126,000 Japanese and American born Japanese. Mm -hmm. And uh, over 60% were native-born citizens like we were. We were born here in the United States, therefore, supposedly, we had the rights as citizens as you have or as you would have. Yeah. But, um, uh, but our parents were, as Lynn said, they were ineligible for citizenship because of the alien law that they had. If you didn't sign up or whatever or report, would they? Well, if you didn't sign up, if you didn't register and go, then you were in violation of the curfew that was imposed at that time. And several people as uh, served as test cases and 
deliberately violated these curfews just to get arrested so that they can prove a point. And they were arrested. And at that time, the, the courts ruled that the government was just in arresting and imprisoning these individuals. But since then, the uh, courts have overturned some of these decisions, that it was a, a violation of their civil liberties. Took a lot of yes. years. That's right. Yeah. And, I, and I think maybe that's what we want to go back to for a few minutes, is just to talk a little bit about uh, your own families at that time, you know. Uh, uh, How old were you even when this happened? Well, I, I was 21. Um, my mother and father had come from Japan in the early part of 1900s, and then my father died when I was 10. But there were five of us in our family, and um, we five were all citizens, American citizens, because we were born in California. I had three brothers and one sister. And one brother had, was already in the U.S. Army at that time. And then I had one brother who was um, out in the working world, and then one had just finished the University of California and was working for the state of California. And I might insert at this time that he was, he had to quit because of the evacuation orders. You were a student nurse, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you had to quit your I was training at the in mm -hmm. Is that That's right. Um, I was at the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center, and we was nursing there, and then I finished my nurse's training at St. Mary's of Rochester, Minnesota, after being out of camp. Now that brings us up to date on, on your family. What about your background, man? Uh, uh, at this point, you two were both students. You weren't married. Uh, no. <laughs> could you tell us a little bit about your family? Well, uh, I have two older sisters that lived in San Francisco as a family all that time. And uh, I was a senior at California Berkeley. And uh, Fortunately, I was able to continue classes until it was time for, for us to really move, at which time it was such that the university allowed us credit for that spring semester in 1942, and I was able to graduate with my class receiving uh, my diploma by mail. Uh, I think the, the sad part was one of our classmates uh, a Japanese-American student had the highest scholastic average in the senior class of 4,000 students, and uh, he was not able to go to commencement to receive his gold medal from the president because he was incarcerated behind in one of these centers. So we want to go back to that moment of, of when uh, it happened now that somebody knocked on your door and said, you are to report uh, we don't know, where did you have to report, uh, what, what was this called, or? Yes, well, uh, I'll, it's just my personal experience, mm -hmm. but uh, I was sent to the Assembly Center, and this was in April, or the first part of May of 1942, and um, the Assembly Centers were just temporary quarters, but they, for, but to facilitate all this, of getting us out of California, they um, picked the easiest way out, I guess. Many of us ended up in, um, Fairgrounds and state fairgrounds and race tracks. tracks. <laughs> That's where you were, right? I was housed yeah. in a ten temporary quarters on a racetrack at the Tanforan, just south of San Francisco. And our family was housed in some whitewashed stalls. Uh, but no one came to our door and says, thou shalt leave tomorrow. They had public signs posted in the neighborhoods, and you're supposed to keep an eye open for when your particular community had to move to the so-called assembly centers. Well, then was it up to you to, to use your own transportation, or do, like were there buses that came through? There was a meeting place for each contingent, and so we just carried our things to whatever meeting place was designated. And then they checked our numbers and gave us tags and, and boarded us on buses. Uh, some probably went by train uh, to in my case, to the racetrack. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And also, when we were in the assembly center, we were uh, living in barracks. Well, like we were living in barracks, uh, but we had to eat at a community 
what we call a mess hall, and that's about what some of the food was at times. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, I guess. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, like, I worked at the hospital, therefore I ate at the dining hall, which was close to the hospital. And my brother worked teaching, so then he ate with his teacher friends at another dining hall, while mother ate where our living quarters were with my sister. And so we were adults, so it wasn't so bad, but when the children and the children were doing this, the family was not a complete unit. They were not even getting together to eat meals together many times. And I think this was sad. And they ha and father couldn't say, all right, come on, everybody, we're eating. Well, we're told whether we're on first call, second call, or third call. And they said, okay, we're on first call, so I want you back here by, let's say, 5.30 because we'll all go to eat together. And he felt that he didn't have that authority to say that anymore because he was not the breadwinner nor the, the head of the family. No, the family structure really mm -hmm. broke down. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you went from that to the internment camp. No, they call them relocation centers. Yeah, and the relocation centers. And uh, you know, where were these then? Mm -hmm. Well, there were 10 of those. Mm -hmm. And there was one in Topaz, Utah. That was where Min was. And then two in Gila, Arizona. And I was in one of those. And then there are others in Colorado and Arkansas and um, Wyoming and Idaho. Idaho. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, Calif two in California. Two, two in California. But, uh, but I think the, the most frightening thing is that um, just like when we were uh, taken from our assembly centers to our relocation centers, we had to go by trains. These trains were quite antiquated because the military were using troop trains and using the better trains. And um, the MPs had their guns out at all times with their bayonets in place, looking over us with their sidearms. And, um, when we stopped on our way from California to Arizona in the middle of the desert to stretch our legs, we had to wait for them to build a ring, a barbed wire fence, and got the MPs out there. Then they let us out in groups to stretch our legs. And I don't know where they thought we'd be going in the middle of the desert, you know, but, but they made sure that we were secure. And, they, and then we had to do it with all our shades drawn, and I don't know whether it was that they didn't want us to know where we were going, or whether they didn't want the people to know that we were in there. Mm -hmm. And maybe they thought they were, you know, trying to make Hide it, it safe for us. Of yeah. The world. But when we're in camp, I mean, y you can imagine living behind barbed wire fence with machine gun towers, mm -hmm. with a machine gun pointed towards camp, 24 hours a day with a spotlight on 24 hours a day. And they tried to tell us that, if, that, um, that we were interned for our own protection. And we said, well, if it's for our protection, why are the guns pointed at us? Why aren't they <laughs> pointed <laughs> outwardly? You know, so, so we, this was to, quote, unquote, protect us, they kept saying. You know. What was camp life really like? I mean, like, psychologically and physically, your surroundings, too? Of course, I speak just for Gila and, and my personal experiences, but um, the communities were usually eight or 10,000 people, and we had about 10,000 there. And when you consider all the needs of, of a town like a 10,000 population, why the needs are many and varied. And there were um, really literally tar paper villages that were modeled after army barracks. And they were so designed to care for troops, really, instead of home family units. Mm -hmm. And so we lived in barracks, six units to a barrack, and a family in each unit. And so we had a room like about 20 by 20. And um, no privacy, because um, you could hear from one end of the barrack to the other what was being said, or people snoring, or bickering, or laughing, or whatever goes on in a normal household. And then we had, of course, bed checks morning and night. And we had internal security in the camps. And we had community bathrooms, back-to-back <laughs> -back stalls with toilet seats and, and no shower stalls, but just one room with a bunch of 
shower heads. And, and it was especially very hard, I felt, for the older people who respected the, each other's privacy and have never lived that type of a free type of living. So well, I think you, you've got the picture of this 20 by 20 space. The only thing that was provided you was a cot and a mattress filled with ticking. And you had to have your own bedding and whatever furniture you had, you had to either buy or scrounge or develop some way or another. But the only, and there's no running water in, in these units. So uh, it was strictly a living quarter or sleeping quarters. And uh, whether you had a family of two or, or, or six or seven, you still got the same space. Yeah. And then you worked at a hospital? Yes, I did. And that hospital was for, for, for Arizona? The, for, for all the Asian for, for that community. Oh, it was for the community of Japanese descendants? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And our parents. Yeah. Also. Okay. And, uh, and uh, we did have some um, civil service workers that came in. And um, we had civil service doctors and then the evacuee doctors and dentists and, and everything from uh, security to... Um, the janitors and everything that, a, like any other hospital would have, with the nurses and the doctors. We also had technicians and dentists and um, dietitians and nurses. And then uh, we had church services every Sunday. We had both the Christian and the Buddhist ceremonies. Uh, we had um, the ministers that some of them lived in camp and some of them uh, went from camp to camp. And others came in from the communities and um, had services for us. So we were very fortunate about that. Because we also had a school set up. We had to because there were 30,000 school-aged second generation and, um, and third generation. And so when you uh, split that up into about 10 camps, you had about 3,000 students in each camp. And so the teacher, we didn't have that many teachers, so a lot of the students your age who were in the midst of their college helped teach school, and those who were graduates helped teach school. And so the students, um, the elementary school system was run really by young adults. I think the intent at that time was to make it as near normal as possible for the residents uh, in terms of their social needs, their educational needs, and within certain bounds, I think these services, at least an attempt was made to provide these services. Uh, and, um, and then we had a lot of cultural things going on. We had, of course, musicians within the group and also people who came in from uh, within the outside of, the com of our community that came and performed for us. And uh, we had arts and crafts and this was especially nice for the Issei folks who, for the first time in their lives, for many of them, they had free time on their hands. They'd been so busy when, wherever they had lived, working from morning till night, that these nice, I say nice things, they didn't have time to do. And maybe they had done it when they were in Japan, but they didn't have the opportunity or the time or the money to pursue since they had come to America, and, th and you should have seen some of the things that they've made and produced. It, it was just unbelievable how talented many of them were. How was the food in your camp? Ooh, <laughs> do you like green eggs? <laughs> 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 we, had no, we had powdered eggs and all. Uh, there was, they said that it cost about 25 to 45 cents a day to feed us. And um, to this day, I do not have grape jelly or apple butter in our house, <laughs> uh, among other things. But, um, uh, but the, uh, the cooks were, we had Japanese food and American food because the, the workers in the uh, mess halls or the dining halls uh, were the evacuees. And a lot of them were good cooks because they used to work at restaurants and um, they were very inventive. And, um, well, I still remember one time when I walked into the mess hall in the middle of the day, and I saw an octopus hanging in the, in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go to eat that night. <laughs> oh, you're selective, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
another thing you mentioned one time when we were talking, Grace, was you told about how your mother made those barracks homey, even under those uh, circumstances. That's right. And she'd crochet pillow tops and uh, made curtains, and uh, she was a seamstress by trade, and so she was very handy with her hands. And, and we made, um, uh, of course, we used blankets as wall partitions, but uh, she was able to do so much around the house with all these little things. And uh, she'd barter with people who would make other things, and she would barter her skills. And uh, so uh, it was a very amicable way of not being able to buy things, but getting things and uh, making your household look a little more homey. There are many opportunities for philosophical conflicts uh, amongst the people there. I think uh, one of them centered around whether the sending let your sons go off to war, for example. Um, that created a lot of tension in many of the camps, and even to the point of having riots. That seems incredible to me, that you're being kept by the United States government, and, and now you're going to volunteer. Well, the young men were asked to volunteer for the services, and this is another, to prove their loyalty. And uh, they were in need of interpreters and translators. And uh, then they, uh, of course, we were brought up going to language school. So uh, some of us were better than others, but at least we had a background. And within our homes, we spoke the language. And they found that it might be easier to teach the um, young men who, who were exposed to the language and had some training to be interpreters and translators and sent overseas. And uh, so they asked for volunteers, and they came to camp. And um, they, they picked up the fellows for military intelligence, plus the 100th Infantry and the 442nd, who were, of course, very, they proved themselves very good soldiers. But um, it was hard, because the families were ridiculed. And they said, well, why should you send your boys off to be killed or possibly be killed when here they, you're, the country is putting you behind barbed wire fence? But you can see the, the type of philosophical conflicts that could arise under those circumstances. Yeah, you? I think it'd be hard for fighting for a country who's done this mm -hmm. to you. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But still, as American citizens, that's your country. You know, I mean, the United States is our country. And Japan is, is the your enemy. So uh, these are some of the unfortunate aspects of what happened during those days. That's right. There were some questionable questionnaires that came by, and, and uh, you answered the wrong way while you were in trouble. <laughs> well, the, the, the older folks who were ineligible for American citizenship were asked to denounce their Japanese citizenship. And uh, this caused a lot of problems because you, you couldn't expect them to give up their Japanese citizenship without giving them something in return. And at that time, that was not possible to give them anything in return. And there are some people who said, the heck with the U.S. We've got a, we owe our allegiance to Japan now. If this is the way the U.S. is going to treat us, we don't want a part of it. And many were repatriated out of these camps on the basis of their answers to the, this, these questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think down the road, they decided that some of these answers were, were given under duress uh, of the moment, and, and they were allowed to come back to the U.S. again. Oh. But then when did your families get out, or how long did this total internment last? Well, I stayed in camp. Men, men came out early. I, ca I spent about a year and a half in camp before I left for my job. And then um, my mother and my brother and family stayed in there until about 45, I think. And uh, the camp itself, see, it opened in 42 in April, and they closed in the spring of 1946. So roughly it was four years of um, camp, if those that stayed till the bitter end. But my, my family went on to Cleveland. But uh, later, you know, many of them did return to the West Coast. And uh, there was still racial discrimination out there. There were vigilantes that took things into their hands. There was arson. There were killings. And uh, in some areas, like the American Legion, uh, scratched out the names of the Nisei names 
on the honor roll of the war dead. Now, you keep using mm -hmm. the term Nisei. Nisei. Okay. I think our students maybe need to know what, okay. what's this terminology? Uh, when, when, when I've been using the word Issei, Issei is the first generation, which would be our parents who came to America. And the Nisei is the second. Ni means two, so second generation, and that's our generation. And then Sansei would be like our son, sons are the third, that would be the third generation. Now, if they have children, Beyonce, which part, and it goes on. This whole thing is just so hard to believe that it even happened. I mean, you know, we're supposed to be a free country and everything. But now, when you look back at this, I'm sure a lot of people look back at it and they think, you know, w we didn't fight back. Are they fighting back now, or, or is anything being done about it today at all? Yes, and, and several things have contributed to what's happening today. Uh, most important is the Freedom of Information Act which released a lot of government documents related to our uh, detention and movement. And it, it gave those of us who were concerned some ammunition to prove that what the government did was done under false pretenses. They, they weren't given the full information when, they, when important decisions were made. This, uh, information was withheld from government agencies uh, so that decisions to move us uh, was very hastily made. But thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, a lot of these papers have come forward and uh, the details of what happened and transpired in those days uh, really came to light. And to investigate the situation, the Congress and the President appointed a commission to study this total episode and this commission, this was in 1980, and this commission came up with a number of recommendations to uh, the Congress, one of which was to recommend that a joint statement be issued by the two houses of the Congress and signed by the President to constitute really an an official apology from the nation for the acts of detention, the acts of exclusion, the acts of removal. And secondly, to demonstrate that an injustice was done by providing some sort of financial redress collectively to this group of people and individually to persons who were affected. So then one, one way is an apology, an official apology, and then the second way distributing money. Financial redress to set up a trust fund for collective as well as individual financial redress, yes. Do you think if this um, bill ever goes through, the education system will be able to teach it more? Because when I was in school, it was... Well, part of this redress funding was to go for education and research. Uh, and, and some of it will be directed towards providing materials to the school systems. Uh, and part of it will go for individual redress, yes. Is there total agreement on the subject of redress? Not absolutely. And there's not, not total agreement amongst even the members of the House that passed this redress bill. And I think it's, it's rightfully so because there are those who feel that others suffered as a result of, of the war 40 years ago. Families were broken up, and they got no compensation for it. People were killed. Some were taken prisoners of war. And we, too, were more or less prisoners of war. But the di big difference is that the, real prison the regular prisoners of war were prisoners of the enemy forces. We were prisoners of our own government. And I think that's the big difference at that point. Today we've had the opportunity to talk to Professor Min Amamiya, Iowa State University in agronomy, and Grace Amamiya, who is um, active in our community and church work and 
has given many speeches to Iowa State University education students on the Japanese internment. Uh, they are the parents of two children. And um, when I talk to them, I, I think about that they are not bitter. And yet they must look back and have some idea about uh, some reflections on this time. Well, we, feel, we of course, we felt very strongly about it. And I do stand up on my soapbox occasionally. <laughs> and uh, in closing, I'd just like to say that, yes, we were incarcerated. That's the word to use, I think. But we were charged with no crime, and we were United States citizens. We were not proven guilty in any court of law, but just by the stroke of the pen by the then President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we were taken away from our homes and put into camps. We were stripped of our freedom and our civil rights as citizens and also subject to military law without martial law even being declared. And um, this incarceration, I think, was an insult to our constitutional liberties as citizens of um, the United States to be incarcerated, charged with only one crime, and that crime being to have been born Americans of Japanese descent with oriental features and living in the wrong area of America. And to me, this is that the Bill of Rights was a mockery. Internment in America? Yes, it can happen. Incarceration in concentration camps in America? Yes, it did happen. But may it never happen again. May our experience, as the example of one of the most disgraceful incidents of our government's history never be repeated. And may I close by saying to all of you, you know, to hold dearly your American citizenship and civil rights and constitutional liberties and don't ever take them for granted because this too could happen to you and or your loved ones just as it happened to us and ours. And uh, when the rights of one minority is threatened, the rights of all are endangered. So with this, I close. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. We appreciate uh, all of the information. Thank you very much.